And welcome to our couch lessons uh, today. It seems to be that we are a very small intimate group, but we will talk about a big and even growing topic about artificial intelligence and sports. I guess that Martin, the moderator of the couch lesson, will say some words about this relationship. But first, I want to introduce myself and the work of the Goethe Institute related to artificial intelligence. My name is Jeanette, and I work for the Goethe Institute headquarters in Munich. The Goethe Institute is the worldwide active cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of the German language abroad and we also encourage international cultural exchange. Last year, we decided to start a program called Generation A is Algorithm, a program that is supported with special funds from the Federal Foreign Office and that aims to sensitize young adults for the risks and possibilities presented by the developments in the field of AI. Because young adults will be surrounded by algorithms in their future life. They uh, present already the largest group on the internet and the largest group of technology users. They know how to use a lot of technology tools, but most of them need more knowledge about AI. With Generation A, the Goethe Institute wants to create a space for critical questions about this technology as well as for testing it. We also want to provide a platform to include the voices of young people into a political discussion about AI. As AI shapes their future life and our society for better or worse, it should be on all of us to decide what direction we will take. The couch lessons are an invitation to find meaning behind the technical developments in the field of AI, to inspire new ways of thinking and to create our collective future. Every week, always on Wednesday, we invite researchers, practitioners, artists, and philosophers to discuss different aspects of AI. We have already spoken about topics like AI and ethics, AI and peace, or AI and creativity. And you can watch all these former episodes on our website. I will post the link after the introduction. I hope you have made yourself comfortable, maybe on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand, and that you will spend a pleasant hour with us. I also hope that you enjoyed the music we played at the beginning as well. It was the song Magic Man from the album Hello World. Hello World was the first multi-artist music album composed with AI. Its goal was to show that AI can be used to create new compelling music. So AI can become creative in a way, but can it also support us in the field of sports? Before I hand over to Martin, I want to start a little poll and want you to ask the following questions. As always, Martin, you have to do this. <laughs> so I hope everyone can see the poll right now. The questions are, have you ever used a technology technological tool to improve your performance in sport activities? And will AI replace personal trainers? As long as we wait for your answers, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of our couch lessons. First, the invited experts will give an input, each about 10 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion. Please use the chat to type in your questions, and I will go through the chat the whole time and pick out some questions that we can discuss later. After the inputs, I will ask different persons to contribute their questions personally. But if I don't ask you to talk, please turn off your microphone. I also want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will just record the persons that are speaking. So I think it's time to hand over to Martin, and I hope he can tell you the results of the poll as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Shanet. And I think you can all see the, the results on the screen now. Uh, so most of you don't think that AI will replace personal trainers, for example. So let's uh, let's see if you change opinion uh, by the end of this uh, hour. Uh, as uh, Jeanette said, my name is Martin. My name is Martin Tönkvist, even, and I'm a curator and concept developer based in Malmö in the very south of Sweden. And with us today, we have uh, Ryan Beal, Klaus Kaldrén, 
and Whitney Jenkins. They're tuning in from Southampton, England, Stockholm, Sweden, and Portland, Oregon in the United States. I'm super excited to hear them share their knowledge and experiences in today's topic, which is AI and sports. Um, before we kick off, please do what uh, Fabio has already done in the chat. Type in where you're uh, joining in from and we'll get a nice uh, sort of room experience going here. Uh, it's truly amazing that all of you have sort of chosen to, to be uh, in this call and not uh, doing uh, something else uh, at this in this hour. So uh, enjoy and uh, please be active in the chat and ask questions uh, you might have as well to the speakers and we will do a Q&A the, in the end. Um, so play is a, an inherently human activity essential for, for learning and for coexisting with, with others in a society. The same is true for, for animals. Playing is something we do for fun uh, and to stay alive and to develop. Uh, and although play in its essence is something we do with the, without a clear goal or for the sake of identifying a winner, we do play games and have for centuries been busy inventing sports with distinct rules and boundaries of how to identify who has won when the game has come to a predefined end. Um, and in 1984, Madonna famously stated that she's a material girl living in a material world. Um, and if that was true, you know, back then, it's certainly true now. Uh, and including in the field of sport that has bo seen both a rapid commercialization and technicalization in the past decades. And it's a, a part of me thinks that's sort of sad, but it's again, you know, in human nature to compete and to develop. And instead of glorifying the purity of the athlete's performance in ancient Olympic games, let's see the technology Let's see the technologies utilized by contemporary athletes as an extension of their, of them being human. And this realization connects to the couch lesson that we, that we organized last week on AI and nature, in which we discussed the fact that humans is a species, that it's a part of a natural world, and that the tools that we create are a part of that world as well. So in the coming 50 minutes, uh, we will look into how AI is used in team sports, how it's used to improve athletes' individual performance, uh, and we will also get an insight how a team of creatives used AI to invent a completely new sport. Um, and to kick us off, I want to introduce you to Ryan Beal. He is a PhD, PhD student at uh, in the Agents Interaction and Complexity Research Group in the Electronics and Computer Science Department at University of Southampton, England. And for us, he's going to give an overview of ways in which AI is utilized to improve teams' performance, both before and during games. So please beam your energy to Ryan Beal. Ryan, the screen and microphone is yours. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll just share my screen now. <clears throat> you able to see my screen there? For should be Absolutely. Yeah. brilliant. Let's make sure. Brilliant. Yeah, like um, Martin said, I'm Ryan Bill from the University of Southampton, um, and I'm going to talk a bit about AI in team sports and an overview of my research and my other work that I've been doing in the last sort of uh, couple of years since I came into this field. So a little bit about me. Um, I started studying computer science um, a few years ago at the University of Southampton. And as part of my undergraduates, I started to learn about artificial intelligence and certain applications that we could have. And immediately I thought this could be applied to team sports and football and other sports. So I looked at my dissertation and did fantasy sports for American football. I then graduated and went to be a data analyst for an accountancy. Um, unfortunately, I found this a little bit boring um, and wanted to go back to my passion and combine AI and sports together. So I went back to do my PhD um, in the AIC research group. So this is a multi-agents research group in the University of Southampton. Um, people are researching all sorts of AI applications to um, teamwork and emergency response and uh, drones and lots of other application fields. And I'm working on applying these techniques into football um, and other team sports. As part of this, I've also started to work with a few companies in industry as well. So I'm part of uh, the founding team at Sentient Sports, as well as Air Abacus, who are looking to improve human decision making in professional teams um, and in particular football recruitment um, and helping teams recruit better players. So a bit about my research. I started my PhD um, 
doing a survey of all the work that's been done in artificial intelligence and team sports. And I picked out a number of challenging areas that I'll come to in a minute. Um, I've also looked at teamwork and how we can form efficient teams based on teamwork between players. Um, and again, I'll come on to a little bit more about this. Um, but as well as those, um, I looked at game tactics and football and how we can use game theory for this. Um, some work comparing different ML techniques, uh, so machine learning techniques, sorry, in the NFL, um, as well as daily fancy football, um, and as well as some natural language processing. So some of the example challenges that I mentioned that we sort of exposed in our, in our first paper, um, we broke it down to these four key sections of where AI can help make predictions and sort of improve decision making and aid humans um, in sports. So firstly, we looked at match outcome prediction. So this is looking at how we can use AI to predict games. Um, so who will win, who will lose, those type of things um, and how this will unfold over a season. Um, we've also looked at strategic and tactical decision making. So this could range from sort of opposition analysis in teams, um, recruitment for football teams, drafting in American sports, um, as well as another a number of other um, sort of items that go into sort of the team sports process um, all the way through. Um, on the athlete side of things, we've looked at injury prediction um, and how we can start to predict when an athlete is likely to, to sort of get an injury if they had similar injuries before. And then if we can intervene and prevent them from getting this injury. And finally, we looked at some fancy sports and gaming, uh, which presents some really nice optimization challenges um, for the AI. So I'll start by talking about sort of the fundamental of AI and any AI problem, um, and that's the data and the data we use to train our models. Um, so in football, a really key data set that's been sort of becoming more and more prominent in the last 10 years that analysts are using at clubs across the world um, is this event level data. So in this, we look at each event in a game and that can sort of tell a story about how the game is unfolding. So in football, if we take sort of a player here um, and that player may pass to, to player two, so you've got player one passing to player two, player two may then dribble the ball and then take a shot. Now we can record this in the event data and we can start to look at how each of those events has taken place. So what event was it? How, what was the outcome of this event? Was it successful? Which players were involved and where did this happen on the pitch? And that sort of tells a really nice story that we can learn from and use to train a lot of the AI models that we'll talk about. So I'll give a bit more detail into the, the decision-making side of things. So as part of the paper that I discussed, um, we looked at breaking down the sort of team sports decision-making process from all the way from like the owners and the chairmen, the people making decisions at the real top level, um, all the way down to sort of coaches and how they can help the athletes at a, a more granular level. Um, so as part of that, that looks at player transfers, um, how we can improve training, how we can improve opposition analysis, picking teams, the tactics, and then how we learn from each game as well. But today I'm going to focus mainly on recruit on player recruitment and transfers um, and this sort of part of that process. So one of the key questions this presents to us is how will a player perform in a new team if they're bought for millions of pounds or euros? Um, you see hundreds of millions being spent on individual players, but there's a lot of uncertainty around this. We don't know how that player will perform. How will they fit in at that new team? Um, so we try and learn how what makes a good transfer and how can we predict how well that player will perform? Um, so this sort of presents a loads of more granular questions. So how will they fit in with their new teammates? Does the playing style of that player fit the new tactics of their new manager? Um, does the way that manager plays in terms of formations and the positions used, is that the positions that the player can play in? Um, is that player good enough for that team? Will that player be good enough in a few years' time if they're not now? Um, and is that player good value for money? So I'm going to give a bit more detail about one of the other research papers I did, which is um, will that player fit in with their new teammates and looking at uh, team chemistry. So team chemistry is a concept that we looked at in terms of teamwork. So how well are these players working together on the pitch? So you can see here a short video uh, looking at the Arsenal team a few years ago and how you can see lots of players linking up positively to break down the opposition's defence and then eventually score a goal. So from this, we wanted to start to identify which pairs of players are sort of positively contributing to the overall impact and performance of the team um, to then extract that and start to sort of um, rate players based on this rather than as individuals like it has been, been done in the past. So here's an example of 
this year in the Premier League. Um, so you can see Son and Kane at the top. So if you know and you watch the English Premier League this season, you'll know they've linked up plenty of times for goals. Um, but you can also see some smaller teams like Aston Villa there. Um, they formed this new partnership of Grealish and Watkins this season who have been very effective and they're now performing much better than they were last season based on this new, uh, this new partnership that they formed from a transfer. So one application of this that was uh, published in, in the paper was looking at how we can form teams and select optimal teams and maximise the teamwork between the players. Um, so to do this, we not only want to pick pairs of players that are great with each other, we want to pick pairs that then create lots of other high teamwork valued pairs within the team. So we can do this by sort of identifying which pairs overlap well with other pairs and then pick out the strong links within the team. Another application, and this is a lot of what I've been doing with AI Abacus recently and helping teams make better decisions and learning from the team chemistry, is predicting what will happen if a pair of players don't currently play together. If you put them together, how are they going to perform on the pitch? So we can use what I've discussed and what we've extracted from the real games and then start to train a neural network based on this. So we're looking at a few different factors. Some of them are on field. So we're looking at who is he linking up with most often? How effective is it? How good are those players? And then in the new team, is there similar players that he will link up with? So if you take Kane and Son, and if Kane was to move to Bayern Munich, is there a player at Bayern Munich who would be like Son that he could link up with and be effective? But we also look at off-field profiles. So does the new team have similar age profile players that it will link up well with? Does he have similar nationalities? Have they played together before? And do they speak the same languages? So the neural network allows us to learn these, fe these features and then predict how well that player will perform in that team. And we can then do this across a whole team and then sort of average out and look at how he'll perform with his whole entire set of new teammates in that team. So a short application, an example of how we've used this. So Liverpool, again, if you watch the English Premier League, I'm sorry it's focused around that. But um, yeah, if you've watched that at the moment, you know Liverpool have got a few centre-back issues. They've, they're all injured. Um, so in January, they're likely to want to buy a new player. Um, so we've used our indexes, the chemistry, as well as a style index, and looking at how well that player is fitting into that style um, to identify some good options for them that if they did buy into a player in January, they'll hit the ground running and it won't take lots of time to sort of get up to speed, which would be a nightmare during the season um, in such a hectic schedule because of COVID. We can then simulate those players into Liverpool and sort of set the, uh, the cost parameters of those players and start to rate which player would be best and where they should invest their money. Um, and by doing this, we identified Jonathan Tarr um, and this work was actually featured in the Sunday Times a few weeks ago in the UK, um, sort of identifying this as a new transfer target for Liverpool. So I'll finish off by giving a bit of a future of AI and team sports. Um, I know I've been very football centric today in this 10 minutes, but that's where my research has been focused. But I think in general, tracking data is going to be where team sports starts to advance in the, in the future. So this is where we start to collect data of every player sort of 20 times a second and the ball. And then we can start to map where those players are going and how well teams are controlling areas of the pitch and predict how defences are going to move and learn from that. Um, so you can see some examples here of it being used in football, American football in the NFL, as well as the NBA. And this is being starting, this is starting to be collected on a more wider basis. Um, and it should be something that comes into, uh, yeah, be more publicly available in the next few years um, so the AI community can learn more from this data. But that's it from me. Thank you for your time today. And I hope uh, that's been a nice quick whistle stop tour of my research and uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, it was super interesting indeed. And uh, we'll get back to you in the end for, for some questions. Uh, and so please, everybody, ask questions in this chat and we'll make sure to incorporate them. Uh, in the discussion after the talks. Uh, and now, now to our next speaker, which is uh, Klaus Calderian. He is the CEO at RaceFox, which is a company developing a real-time voice coaching applications for athletes using AI for translating data into meaningful uh, feedback to the, uh, to the athletes. So please welcome uh, Klaus Calderian. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Oh, I'm sharing now, right? Correct. Good. So uh, my name is Klaus Kalven, um, and I'm Swedish and I'm working uh, with a uh, fantastically intriguing and interesting company, which is called RaceFox. Uh, we're trying to tackle a fairly difficult problem, which is, you know, running. Um, 
Now, most people aspire to do running. It's like the kind of one of the original survival strategies uh, was to be runners. And, and uh, everyone can run in one way or another. Uh, and we aspire to run more. Um, we have lots of info around running, but on an individual basis, we often have very little knowledge about, about the sport. And once we get started, we often fall out of habit. You know, you, you, you maybe you start running and then you run for a couple of weeks and then something happens and then you fall out of the habit. So it's actually kind of hard to, to uh, have running as a meaningful form of exercising uh, with all the positive effects that we know are in there. So we kind of, uh, we, we thought about how we could do something about this problem. Uh, and we realized that um, to become a regular runner, you need a couple of things that are quite hard to emulate. You need motivation, you need actionable input, uh, and you need kind of the smartness uh, on how you're going to go about this. Uh, we, we call it the smartness of the collective, i.e. learning from what everyone else does and what works for them. And so that, that is a very good application area for artificial intelligence. Uh, so what RaceFox did was that we built an app because the smartphone is a very expensive and underused platform that everyone is carrying around. And then we, we combine that uh, app with a sensor because AI needs data and we needed a lot of data. And then we figured out how we could use this phone uh, to produ produce real-time voice because that is uh, quite handy when you're out running, not having to read from a screen, but you can actually listen to commands. And in essence, I mean, RaceFox rocks, uh, this methodology that we developed to, for real-time coaching uh, has a great impact. Uh, you can run faster, uh, our customers run more. Uh, so it seems to work uh, wonders with both motivation and um, and the smartness and the real time uh, helps with the, the improvement. And so what I want to uh, go through a little bit here now is how do you create a smart coach that, uh, that um, that will help you, you know, get motivated, give you input, and uh, drive you forward in a clever way. And that's that's what we did. I'm simplifying this process now because it's a consumer service, and uh, at the top of it, it should be really easy and simple to use. But of course, uh, the, the, it's kind of, it was kind of hard to build all the elements that we realized you needed to have. You know, with the purpose of making it easy for you, uh, pu pulling all the strings together in the background. The first one is voice, because uh, voice is really good uh, to provide short um, input to you with. Like when you're out running, you don't need a lecture. Uh, you need something short. Um, your body's maybe under strain and you cannot process so much information. There are English, um, very good research from Wales, I think, that uh, where, where, you, uh, where they test out exactly how cues, which cues work best for the human psychology. The, uh, so we, we use that kind of uh, thinking. We combined it with the realization that uh, to make running easy, you need to personalize uh, the feedback uh, to a large extent. Otherwise, it doesn't feel relevant. And if it doesn't feel relevant, you won't trust it. If you don't trust it, you won't get the motivation uh, that, that is required to get people to, to exercise more. And the last piece of the puzzle to build a real-time coach uh, was that information needs to come as soon as possible to where you're exercising and doing the movement. Like it, it, the data from science shows that the faster you get feedback, 
the easier it is to remember and learn. So actually we try to give feedback like every step. Uh, one way of doing that is to have, um, if you want to manipulate your kind of step frequency, we can use a metronome uh, so you get immediate feedback. We also have an app for skiing and there, you know, you get uh, feedback positive or negative after every stroke. And the interesting thing is that with that kind of real time feedback, it is easier to to learn to change whatever you're doing in another way with this input. Um, So it all landed in a real-time voice coaching. And as we have been playing along with, with this concept and developed it, we realized that it is, uh, it is a very easy, it, it is very engaging and easy way to convey uh, information from the AI to the user. Uh, and it supports faster learning. Um, so with RaceFox, the app, as I mentioned, and the sensor, we can then uh, we can then provide the user with um, the real time personalized coaching, and that has positive effects on the motivational factors that the runner needs. The trick in this has been to uh, make all the components work, to read the sensor data interpret it, translate it into some voice cues that you can understand and make sure that that voice cue is personalized and then push it through the headphones to the user. Um, and the thing is that uh, the, the, the conclusion from this is that, that uh, in order to get this to work, uh, there is only one approach actually, and that is to constantly test and improve step by step. So um, humans design a, a, an idea about what you're going to do, and then you try it on a lot of people, and then you get feedback, and then you try it again, and then you get feedback, and then you try it again. And then we can see how well that works over time because we get the data feedback that is required then. So how do we use AI in this, uh, in producing this experience? Well, there are two ways uh, that we use AI to make this service smart, basically. One is that we are taking uh, a lot of data from this sensor that is put on the runner's chest. And, uh, and that data is, very fine in its, in its uh, granularity so that we can uh, read out a lot uh, from that data about what, is, uh, what kind of forces is going on uh, when you're running. And we have uh, hundreds of millions of running step in our data now, and we can use machine learning to interpret this data so it becomes comparable between different individuals and different body types. We can then make generalized coaching input based on that. And the second area is that we can learn from what works, what type of feedback works and what type of training structure uh, has positive effects on people on different levels. So we can use that to optimize um, uh, what type of advice we do and we can enhance the smartness in the service. Um, the, uh, the, the main thing here um, in, this, in, in the smart service is also that of course, we have to simplify everything in terms of usage. So we have to make sure that as much as possible of there is as little as possible AI shown on the surface of the service, but as much as possible under the hood. 
Uh, and that is a fine and difficult balance, I think, when you're doing at least a consumer service and that we struggle with. That it should, um, it should feel like it is a human being that are giving you input uh, and advice. Uh, but uh, under the hood, you need a lot of technology not to break this kind of magic. Um, so, the idea of um, giving real-time coaching to a runner that is smart and is personalized and using voice as your companion when you're out running, it has very positive effects. Um, uh, our customers improve their technique by understanding how to run better and that makes them run faster. We also have a ski app, actually, the beginnings of Racefox was in cross-country skiing, and there the effects are even uh, more dramatic because skiing is a technically more difficult sport. But what I think is more interesting, actually, uh, is that uh, we can see that our customers over time double their kind of maximal distances that they do, so they learn how to run longer. And we can also see that the feedback loop about running technique and how to run better uh, and the smart kind of um, the, the, the advice we give our customers on what type of session to do builds up resilience over time and helps people to address their imbalances. Because if it's a problem for most people to get started in running, once they do, then a lot of them get injured or uh, start too fast or strive to run faster and push themselves too hard. It's really, uh, um, it's really a balance between, between uh, uh, you know, getting out and exercising and not over-exercising for most people. You can always download the app and try. You can do it without a belt uh, and see for yourself what you like, uh, uh, how you like this technology. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus. Uh, and uh, same for you. We will get back to you uh, after the last presentation for some, for some questions, but thank you very much uh, for now. Um, so in the past two presentations, uh, we've heard about the role AI uh, is playing in improving sports, performance in sports and exercises that's been around for centuries. But in the coming talk, we will get the insights into how a sport was created in collaboration with uh, AI technologies. And with us, we have Whitney Jenkins. He is the executive creative director at the digital design agency Laundry Service. Uh, and uh, yeah, he will present uh, the, the, a new game called Speedgate or a new sport called Speedgate. So, so with me, the screen and microphone is yours. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Martin. Uh, hi, everybody. I know we've got folks from all over the world. Um, I am in Portland, Oregon in the United States, and uh, it's really early in the morning. So hopefully it's been a good day for the rest of you. I'm looking forward to having the rest of it after this call. Um, I'm excited to be able to join um, this awesome group and, and uh, really loved what I've heard from, from Ryan and Klaus, just so many um, great applications for AI. Uh, let me share my screen and talk a little bit about Speedgate. So um, I work for a digital innovation agency. And last year, I had a team that we really wanted to take a look at AI and, and see if there was an opportunity to create something that um, we, we kind of targeted as being an inherently human experience. So if you think about a lot of the things that we've seen AI do, it usually processes, um, it can process data to help us make smarter decisions. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but AI has been utilized for over 20 years to actually predict the weather. Um, so when we use weather apps or meteorologists give us a, 
uh, forecast, um, a lot of that data has been processed by really early AI modules. But our team really wanted to see, could we create, could we utilize AI to create a inherently human experience? And what, what I mean by that is uh, something that only humans could really experience and could understand. And so um, I uh, live in Portland, Oregon. This is the home of Nike. Um, I've uh, played sports my whole life and our team thought, what if we utilized AI to try to invent a new sport from scratch, which was really kind of a, a very fun and an exciting undertaking. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about uh, how we utilized AI to do that. We started with three criteria. I think one of the things that's really important about using AI as a creative partner is you really have to identify early what your objectives are and what you want to accomplish. So for us, the three criteria is we wanted first um, a game that was easy to learn and fun to play. If you think about games like uh, football or soccer, as they say in, um, in the States or basketball, even if you've never played it, you could watch and within a minute or two, you could understand, okay, I, I, I dribble the ball and then I shoot it and it has to go into that hoop up, in the, up on the backboard, right? Or, oh, I get it. I kick the ball, I can't touch it and I need to kick it into that net. So we wanted our first criteria to be something that we knew that would be easy to play. Uh, two, we wanted it to be accessible to all types of athletes. So we wanted a game that could work on multiple surfaces. So it could work on a grassy field or a pitch. It could work on a hard court. It could be scalable. Um, it could uh, work for people that are mobile and can run, but could also adapt easily to uh, wheelchairs. And third, we wanted something that was really physically engaging. And our criteria for there was something that really made for a good workout. Um, for any of you that grew up playing basketball or, or soccer, it's a lot of running. You are running all of the time. If any of you have played baseball, you're not running so much. It's a lot of waiting until it's your turn. So we wanted something that was going to provide a really great workout. Um, it's really important to know that anytime you're creating a new experience with AI, it is a collaborative process and understanding how to process that data is part of what makes for a good experience. You don't just plug all the data into the computer and then just wait for the magic to appear. It's really about understanding the data, processing it, and understanding how we as humans process that, and then taking your findings and putting them back into an AI module. So this is just uh, to kind of show how we really worked through this. So we trained our algorithms, it created outputs, we got results from the AI and then we use that to process that data. And I'll show a little bit about kind of what that looks like. So um, the sport concept really started with us feeding 400 different sport criterias into a computer. And it's important to know AI doesn't understand what hockey is. AI doesn't understand what, what uh, uh, baseball is or, or winter sports like uh, snowboarding or luge, but it can understand a person kicking or throwing or doing something with an objective. And so those are the types of criteria that we fed into our AI system were sport-like concepts. So if you think about um, you know, table tennis, two people with a table holding mallets, hitting a ball back and forth, and AI can understand that. Or if you look at football or soccer, you can see you know, multiple players on a very large field passing and kicking a ball to each other with the goal to score on the opposite side. So we took all of these AI concepts and fed them into a uh, RNN, which is a, um, a uh, 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 neural network. And basically what that did is it gave us a lot of really crazy and wacky outputs of sport-like ideas. And what that required us to do is to figure out, well, what does that actually mean for humans that are gonna turn this into a sport? So there was a lot of field testing. And then once we started testing things and finding something that we liked and that was fun and that was playable, then we went back to AI and said, okay, 
what would the rules be for a field sport with this type of criteria? So it wasn't just like waiting for one input and AI spit out a perfect game. It was looking at figuring out what the construct is of the game and then testing it and then going back to AI and say, help us figure out all of the rules, the scoring, the team structure, offense, defense, um, and then go from there. And that led us to ultimately finding a sport that we really loved, which I'm excited to share in just a moment. Um, so again, our sport really was a, a culmination of the best of AI and the best of our human uh, thinking and application to this. Uh, we processed over 1,100 AI outputs, um, analyzed and interpreted by our team. We then fed back all of that into the algorithm, um, constantly refining the output for over eight rounds. It basically was about a three month process from the time we started to the time we actually had some outputs that made sense for us as, as athletes uh, inventing a new sport. Um, people always ask, were there some really crazy sport ideas that uh, didn't make the cut? And of course there were, this is my favorite thing to share. These were some of the uh, final outputs from our AI module. Um, some of them were really daring. So there was an idea of an underwater obstacle course. So imagine parkour, but underwater. Um, one of the things that I love about this is AI doesn't realize that you know humans need oxygen because it sees things like water polo or diving and it goes well why couldn't you create a whole sport underwater that makes great sense right that'd be a great idea so underwater uh, parkour did not make the cut um, some others were really interesting there is a lot of sports around the world that uh, utilize um, uh, things like the biathlon which is target shooting and so um, this one was an exploding disc relay where you are running around a track and then discs are being thrown and the AI said, and the discs could explode at any time, which was terrifying. So obviously this was not another idea that we wanted to do. Um, and then my favorite was uh, a suggestion that two players would dangle high above a from hot air balloons and would stand on a tightrope and would play some form of a racket game uh, with each other. And we called this hot air balloon tightrope rackets, which of course also, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Red Bull would probably love this and could turn this into something incredible. But, you know, for us, it just was not, again, easy to learn, fun to play, not something, not everybody has a hot air balloon, let alone two, um, or feels comfortable, you know, playing a, a, a game of uh, tennis, um, you know, at 30,000 feet. So where we ended was a game that the AI named Speedgate. And Speedgate is really a combination of a few different things. Um, again, it's important to know that the way we interpret this as humans is, is it's how we interpret the data. So, so the module did not say, hey, let's combine you know, soccer and, and croquet. But when we looked at the outputs, we're like, this is like a combination of soccer and croquet. So it's, it's our human interpretation of the AI modules. Um, so this is a, a little video and this is a look at Speedgate. Um, I don't have any audio here uh, just because of some of the music rights, but um, Basically, this is us testing it. So uh, the field itself has three circular gates and you see that there's, there's poles, uh, there's three forwards, there's three defenders, and there's three gates, as you can see there on the field. You are basically um, passing or kicking to uh, other players and you must kick it through one of the gates in order to score on one of the end gates on the other side. So there's a big gate in the middle and then there's two small gates on the side. So kind of like croquet meets soccer meets rugby. Um, and again, we tested a number of different sports, but this one we just loved. And as we continue to refine it, it just got more and more fun. Um, so this was just a little video kind of highlighting some of the gameplay. Uh, we did set up a league in Portland. We played every single Saturday until COVID started. And so we are very sad. We haven't played for many months, but as soon as COVID's over, we're excited to get back on the field um, and play again. So I wanted to take just a second and talk a little bit. Um, I know the video was hard. It was a lot of moving picture. So 
basically three gates. And if you think about croquet, you're hitting a small ball through a, a series of, of little hoops. And in speed gate, just imagine that on a grand scale, the center gate is actually 20 feet wide. And you notice that there's an X in the middle. One of the things that the AI came up with is that there was an area where players were not allowed to pass. And we thought, well, that's interesting. Not sure what that means, but we had the idea would it create a unique strategy, both offensively and defensively, if the center gate was not passable physically? So players can run around it, but the ball has to pass through it uh, with a kick. So that allowed um, us to create really unique strategies from, a, from a, a team standpoint, because unlike maybe soccer or, or basketball, where a hot shot could take the ball from one end all the way to the, all the, way to the other and score, in speed gate, you can't do that because you can't cross the gate until you've passed it to a teammate in order to unlock it and uh, to progress to the other end of the field. Um, so there's the center gates and the end gates. Also, a lot of the moves um, were suggested in the AI is that anyone could pass or kick. And so we looked at uh, some of the different ways that um, things are, are passed and kicked through both soccer and rugby. We tried it with just a soccer ball and it felt too much just like a, a, a soccer training module. When we added the rugby ball, um, it got really, really interesting because the ball itself is really unique in how it bounces and how it moves. And so that's something that we adopted. Uh, we tried a number of different types of balls from um, small balls that you throw with your hand to like a Frisbee um, and ultimately ended up with a, a rugby ball, uh, which we really loved. Um, one of the other things that was interesting, the AI also talked about that scoring could be advanced if there were multiple players that scored. And we were like, well, we're not quite sure what that means. So the idea that we had that our human application was that if someone kicked the ball through the gates, that would be a two point goal. But if they kicked it through the gate and scored and a teammate caught it and kicked it back through, then that would be a three point goal. Again, enhancing the, the aspects of, uh, of team play. And so a lot of the AI modules were kind of crazy things that we thought that sounds interesting, but we have to figure out humanly how to, how to apply that. Um, we also used a DC GAN module to actually help us define the look of our sport. So this is actually the AI learning that uh, we plugged in about a thousand different sports logos. So anything from, um, uh, from the Premier League to um, NBA, NFL, all of the different sports around the world. And uh, the computer just processed over and over and over all of these different sports logos. And these are some of the actual outputs. This is what the computer came up with. So obviously none of these look really great or really polished. But what we did do is we identified a few of them that we thought were really interesting with either the color palette or the shape. And then we utilized those to actually create our logo for the sport. So we took some that we really liked, the notion of a shield, the notion of the colors, uh, in this one, you see there's kind of the two lines and we thought, well, that looks a lot like the actual gate in speed gate. And so we gave that to one of our designers and came up with this final logo inspired by the, uh, the AI results. Uh, one of the last things that's really funny about AI is it came up with a motto. This was one of the outputs. We didn't ask it to do this. It came up with this line that just said, face the ball to be the ball to be above the ball. Uh, we thought it was hilarious, um, but also in many ways, it kind of made sense, like what an AI coach might tell you. So face the ball, you know, in baseball, they say, keep your eye on the ball. Um, to be the ball, we thought, well, that's like, you know, think like the ball, right? Like move like the ball. And then to be above the ball, one of the interesting things in speed gate is that the ball must pass below the six foot gates. So the ball plays low. The ball is always, uh, it's a low game. It's not like American football where you're, you're throwing Hail Mary passes. So to be above the ball, we thought, well, that makes sense too, because you got to keep the ball low and you physically should always be above the ball. So we took that and uh, turned that into our, um, our mantra uh, with the content as well. And so, um, yeah, that was a really exciting part of this. Um, so yeah, this was some of the posters that we designed, face the ball, be the ball, be above the ball. Uh, and then lastly is just a thank you to the AI. We wanted to personify it. So this was something that our team decided to do. So one of our awesome designers created 
a um, AI robot that plays that plays the game. This is Gunner, the gate bot. One of the AI outputs said that whoever scores the most points is named the Gunner, and we were like, "Okay, that sounds interesting." So we named uh, the robot Gunner, the gate bot, because in the creation of Speedgate, Gunner scored the most points, uh, more points than the human did. Um, and so that's Gunner, our gate bot, and um, yeah. Uh, we have a website, playspeedgate.org, where you can um, download all of the rules and a map to create your own field. Uh, we have links to all of the equipment. Um, Forza, which a lot of people know in the UK, actually creates uh, slalom training poles that work great for Speedgate. And um, we use uh, practice rugby balls because they're softer and they're easier to play with. And so there's links to all pre-existing equipment rules and regulations. Um, and I'm actually the administrator of, of Speedgate and the commissioner of Speedgate in North America. So if you want to start a league or have any questions, um, you can find me on playspeedgate.org. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Whitney. This was uh, fun and, and uh, lots of interesting learnings in there uh, as well. Uh, thank you also to Ryan and to, to Klaus. Uh, we have uh, time for some questions. So everybody listening, please post questions if you do have them. Uh, otherwise, we would just uh, go on with the conversation. And so, so Whitney, I, I'm curious. I mean, you work at a, you know, in a communications agency and, and now you've been playing with, with like a, a new technology. And what are some of the learnings from, from, from a communications perspective in, in playing around with these new technologies? Um, you know, there's always there's always the joke of when are the robots going to take over, right? When when do we all lose our jobs? Um, the more I work with AI, the more I realize that it requires human creativity to kind of create that final lens and that final application. Um, I always say, with regard to Speedgate, we as humans never could have come up with Speedgate, and the AI never could have come up with Speedgate. It really required both parties working together. Um, and I, again, that's why I kind of emphasize human experience. I think AI at its best helps us to better understand how to make decisions. And, um, you know, I think for all three of us presenting today, um, AI helps us to either be more motivated or to try something new or, you know, for a, a you know, a coach to better understand, like, how to best utilize his team or, or, or trading players. So it, it really comes down to the human engagement, which um, I think makes AI most valuable. And to you, Ryan, I mean, on that point, I mean, how do you, have you, have you already seen sort of, you know, coaches started to collaborate with AI in this way or, uh, and do you think that it will require like a, a different type of football coach, for example, going forward? Yeah, yeah, I think that's the same with any sport. You, you get that famous scene in Moneyball. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the, the book and the film with Brad Pitt. And uh, there's a, a, an old, a book, group of old scouts sat around their, a table and they're trying to introduce these new metrics to buy new players and draft players. And uh, the old scouts are, don't want to accept these new metrics. And it's, it's trying to convince those people to uh, accept AI and start using it in the right way and not to be scared of the fact it's not going to take your job. It's trying to to help your job and make you help make better decisions um, and yeah, improve, improve decision-making in all aspects really. And Ryan, do you, do you see that there is like any risk of say sort of, you know, taking away uh, some of the charms of, of sports with in, in sort of, you know, using tools like these? No, I think technology into sport is always just, it's just going to throw up more debate. Um, you look at things like uh, VAR in uh, in the Premier League and in, in across Europe in football now, it has caused more debate than it's stopped. It's not, there was always this argument that it might uh, take away the human aspect of refereeing, but all it's done is create more debate and sparked more interest in it. Um, and I think that's the same with any of this. You, you can never take that away from sport and actually predicting how humans perform is not a perfect science. Uh, you, you can't take that away from any of sport in general. And that's why it's so popular across the world. Uh, and, and, and to you, Klaus, I mean, you, you spoke about, um, you know, this, this app being like a personal coach. And do you see that the app will sort of uh, be, be used instead of personal coaches? Or do you rather see this as like a personal coach on scale? No, I, I don't think uh, there is a, you know, a, a physical coach has totally different values um, to, to provide. 
I don't think so. But I think a lot of us, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have so much time. So there's a slot, there's 30 minutes in between cooking and putting the kids to bed. And, uh, and what our service does is to provide you with a meaningful context there and, and uh, uh, make sure that you do the right stuff, basically. And the right stuff might not be to, like I used to do, like go out, run until you puke for 30 minutes so that you will feel really tired and think that that has anything to do with you improving as a runner which it doesn't so 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 it kind of that's that's the problem we're trying to solve like a, an everyday problem um in a situation that is quite complicated to master and just you know providing the the right little input there in real time yeah i think a coach that is a total this is it's a not a type of experience but it's a larger experience also there's like this other human being with all their knowledge and experience and maybe this coach is a very good runner and you get inspired from that maybe there's a social context with other runners you know that that's a different thing yeah and ryan you mentioned that you work within a group that sort of look at teamwork in a wider spectrum and also a lot of your presentation focused on sort of the teamwork in team sports. Uh, is there anything you can say about, um, you know, applications with, from this research uh, in, you know, the office setting or other type of teamwork? Yeah, it'd be really interesting. I think it's all comes down to data collection. And if you can start to collect um, good data in an office setting about what teams are doing together and then identify a project team based on how they performed over the last few years i mean in a similar way i could see that being being applicable and it's it sort of was inspired from work in emergency response like i said before it's uh, how teams are formed um, in emergency response versus um, being suitable for the task they're going to do and how you can sort of dispatch um, certain emergency services to certain areas based on feedback from a drone and uh, all of those sort of uh, seminal papers in that area sort of led into effectively what I did in uh, in teamwork and looking at that in football. It's it's been inspired from that and how we can start to evaluate sort of individuals and teams and sets of players rather than just uh, ju- just players as as, a, as an individual in the team. And and with in in sort of looking into creating this sport. Uh, did you already sort of dream about sort of your next project? Is there any other field that you want to sort of create a new, uh, a new um, yeah, situation in or? Yeah, um, I think, you know, honestly, when we started the project, uh, a sport was one of many ideas that we had on the table. We, uh, a lot of us really love to ride bikes in Portland. It's a very bike friendly place like Amsterdam. And so we thought, I wonder if AI could help us design a new bike frame or, uh, uh, you know, not, not that it hasn't been uh, worked on for hundreds and hundreds of years, but again, just thought maybe that was interesting. Um, I think, you know, for me, ultimately my goal for Speedgate is that ultimately it would become adopted as, as a, a sport that kids, you know, would play um, at school and ultimately would gain a status where no one would remember the AI part anymore and it would just be a great sport. And I think for me, that's kind of a bigger vision of AI is that it it does become a a seamless technology that we utilize. And so we don't see the computer, it actually helps us to, uh, to have a better human experience. So I think for me, that's what I'm most excited about is to utilize AI as a a member of our team to help us um, crack new and and better ideas um and and i i think even quicker too i i think um um you know there's there's something to be said for how quickly you can discover new things utilizing a uh, ai module but why is that important to you to sort of you know take sort of make people forget that ai was a part of it and Klaus was mentioning this as well in his when they sort of develop their app that you don't want the notion that it's sort of ai powered why is that in, important for you well, I think, you know, if any of you have like a voice assistant thing at home, whether you have like, uh, you know, Siri or Alexa, we have Alexa in my home, we would not utilize Alexa if she didn't have a human pleasant voice, right? If, if I actually felt like I was talking to a computer, I don't think my kids would engage with her and it would create a more kind of cold and robotic experience. So I, I think a big part of what will make AI successful in its applications is the way that it fits 
how we want to interact with each other as humans and the type of human experiences that we want to have. Okay, so I have one last question and that, that's for all of you. So you've spent a lot of time sort of analyzing sports and exercises. Uh, and is there, a, do you sort of look at your own exercises or your own sort of, you know, performance differently? And also sort of do you watch sports differently if, after your, all your research? I, uh, I, I think I, I've learned... Um, we we and i as an individual has learned a, a lot of things uh, about uh, um, about human movement and it has tremendously changed my my understanding would i have been able to do that uh, with a with a very good coach and you know just flowing into the topic perhaps yes but uh, the, the the thing here which is another aspect we didn't touch upon is that uh, on a AI powered platform, you have the possibility to distribute the same knowledge to large audiences, which you don't have in the one-to-one. -one. So it is kind of, that was I, what I meant with the, the smartness of the collective. You, you can distribute a lot of knowledge very rapidly out to a lot of people. Uh, and so, so that, that is uh, a new thing. Ryan, are you a better football player and do you watch the Premier League differently now? I guess it makes you watch football differently. I guess the example to give is fancy football is really big in, in the UK and I know it is in the US as well. Um, and it helps you sort of make decisions better when you look at who's going to go into your fancy team each week and you sort of start thinking, oh, those pair of players are going to work well together when you see the lineup. So it, it does give you a different aspect. And what would you with me? Um, I, I mean, I definitely have exercised a lot more once we invented Speedgate. <laughs> And I agree, with, I agree with class. I can't, I can't run for 30 minutes without feeling like I'm going to hurl either. So uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to try your app. Good. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for, for participating as speakers. And also thank you to everybody listening. Uh, I just want to hand over to, to Shanet for some final words. Yeah, first of all, I also want to thank Ryan class and Whitney. It was great that you could join us and, I was thinking about that I should maybe use AI to invent a sport I'm finally good at. And next week we will speak about AI and inclusion and we will ask uh, how the countries of the global south are involved in the development and the use of AI and how can people with disabilities participate in AI. And I also want to mention our new format, the Intimate Couch Lesson, that will take place on December 18. And after 21 couch lessons on various perspectives of how AI technologies affect society, we want to provide a more intimate space, small virtual rooms where you can meet with experts. We have already invited 32 experts and yeah we would like to welcome you as well in our intimate couch lesson uh, and we hope that we will see you again next week next wednesday have a nice week until then and thanks for joining us <laughs>